Now, on the scale of really large, important battles, this is nothing on the scale of, say, the Battle of Quebec that I talked about earlier. It's a siege that happens very quickly, um, uh, and yet at the same time, it's incredibly decisive. And then Washington, during most of the American Revolution, had avoided very decisive movements because Washington's primary strategy was to keep his army intact. He didn't have very much of an army, he didn't have a very well-trained army or a very well-disciplined army. But if he could keep his army intact, then he would not be able to surrender to the British. And the idea was just to keep the British fighting and fighting and fighting until they got so tired that they had had enough and were going to wash their hands of it. And of course, along the way, Washington had a lot of help from uh, different state militias. But here, this is, this is the big decisive action of the, Ameri of, of the American Revolution. And of course, they're able to do it because of the, 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 the French. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea about how decisive this is, when Cornwallis surrendered, he surrendered 8,000 British troops. And 8,000 British troops was 25% of the troops in America at the time. Now, it might not strike you, and it didn't necess necessarily strike Washington or Rochambeau at the time, that this was going to be the last battle of the American Revolution. But uh, even though there were 25% or even though there were 75% of the troops left in North America, um, for England, this kind of signaled the beginning of the end. And I'll just give you a couple of dates to show how the Battle of Yorktown influenced decisions in England to continue the war, or rather not continue the war. So the Battle of Yorktown is won on the 17th of October, 1781. News travels slowly in the 18th century, especially if you're an ocean away. So England doesn't find out about the Battle of Yorktown until November 25th, 1781. So a little over a month later. A few days after they find out about the Battle of Yorktown, um, England decides on the 8th of December to, to no longer send any more troops to America. They are no longer going to be sending troops to America. They, are, they, they, have, they have cut off uh, the idea of, of involving more British troops in this, in this debacle. Shortly after that, on the 17th of February in 1782, um, the, the House of Commons votes to end the war. So the House of Commons is not all of England, but the House of Commons votes to end the war. And shortly after then, at the 4th of March, um, they actually vote something that says, if you try to pursue this war against the Americans, you will be condemned for treason. So that's very quick. So it's very quick, it's just a couple of months between the end of the Battle of Yorktown and the idea that if you continue trying to fight this war, we will accuse you of treason. So the Battle of Yorktown really is what convinced um, the British that they were going to have to withdraw. And again, there's a lot to thank, um, uh, uh, it, there's, a, there's a lot to thank um, the French for all of this. And the French alliance with America is largely, we like to focus on the Battle of Yorktown. And there's good reason why, because the French were good at sieges, and they had troops, and they had a navy, which was so important. Um, but in allying with America, the French didn't just provide troops, and they didn't just provide money, but they provided a certain amount of legitimacy for this, this burgeoning nation. Um, it was important for the United States, this new United States, if it was going to succeed, not just to be recognized as no longer part of Britain, but to be recognized as a country in its own right. And the fact that the French allied with it, and when the, when the French signed the Treaty of Alliance, they actually referred to these colonies as the United States. Um, it, helped, it, helped the, uh, it helped the Americans have a certain amount of clout um, with other countries in Europe. And it was going to help them further establish themselves as an independent nation that wasn't tied to Britain or anything else. And not only was it no longer tied to Britain, but it was a, a, a united nation in its own right. It wasn't just scattered colonies that had been left by its mother country. So again, we have a lot to thank France for this. Usually when I, usually when I teach the Battle of Yorktown, or if I'm teaching in the month of October and we happen to fall on the date of the Battle of Yorktown, I make all of my students say, thank you, France. <laughs> and they usually roll their eyes at me and say, Thank you, France. <laughs> and then someone, is, someone is always makes some kind of smarmy remark about World War II, um, at which point I usually remind them that we cannot say you're welcome to the French for World War II because none of us were alive then, frankly, at least none of the people who are usually found in my classroom. Um, but, the reason, but we still can't thank the French for the Battle of Yorktown because without the Battle of Yorktown, who knows if and when the British would have withdrawn. So thank you, France. Um, I'd also like to take an opportunity to show some more pictures related to the Battle of Yorktown. This oh, is very heavy. Oof. This is a, uh, actually a 19th century drawing trying to depict uh, the Battle of Yorktown. And again, many of the of like larger portraits I'm showing you, of course, are not presenting an actual scene, but are trying to present kind of an overall image of what happened during the Battle of Yorktown. And I really like this image because you can see um, here, this man right here is George Washington. 
Um, and you can kind of see he's looking over his left shoulder and he's kind of gesturing with his hands. And here is Rochambeau. And Rochambeau is standing kind of in front of General Washington. Rochambeau is standing kind of is standing in front of General Washington in this um, in this picture and is gesturing outward, which gives the impression that Rochambeau is the one running the battle and Washambeau and um, Washington is allowing him to do it. And so I like this image because I I think it kind of presents um, kind of a, 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 a brief image which gives an idea of exactly who did what um, at the Battle of Yorktown. Now, as much as I often like to say, thank you, France, um, the Battle of Yorktown also was a very good thing for France. Um, they didn't just lose some soldiers in the Battle of Yorktown and um, put their navy at risk. Um, but for the French, this was also a very large victory that they like to talk about as well. And I'm going to come over here and show this picture, which is of Lafayette. And this is Lafayette standing next to his horse. And he actually had an aide who was um, uh, 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 African-American with him. And here he is pointing to the Battle of Yorktown with his left hand. And he's got a very big smile on his face because he's very happy because Lafayette played an important role in the Battle of Yorktown as well. And remember that France, this is the first conflict that France is participating in since they lost the Seven Years' War in 1763. And you remember that there were many uh, young officers who wanted to volunteer for the American army so that they could gain prestige and they could have a chance to show themselves off in battle. And here, this was a, 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 a a, a victory that the French army could claim, and it's their first victory since they lost terribly during the Seven Years' War. And so it's one that they also were very proud of. And in addition, the American army, I'm going to put this down. In addition, the American army had obtained a certain elite status in France. And that might seem odd to us because most of us know that the American army was not bad, all things considered, but the American army wasn't a highly disciplined, polished European army like what the French are used to. But that actually kind of helped um, uh, uh, the French conceive of the American army. And the American army was um, often sometimes poorly put together. Uh, the, often the, the troops were not well trained or were not interested in being well trained. Often the officers did not have any kind of experience um, uh, serving in an army beforehand. But the French thought this was a really interesting and intriguing experiment. Because the French army had just lost the Seven Years' War, many French officers were open to other ideas about how to approach organizing their army. And so they paid particular attention when they saw something that resembled a citizen army cropping up in America. And of course, because they were, they were very interested to see the citizen army succeed, um, they, they looked at it in such a rosy colored light that they missed a lot of the problems that you have with a citizen army, or at least a lot of the problems that General Washington has with, had with his army. But the American army in French literature and in French newspapers and in French poetry and in French songs and in French images were often presented as this wonderful patriotic group of hardy people who had been uh, uh, raised from infancy to fight for their beloved patrie, their beloved homeland, and who will stop at nothing for independence and liberty. And while this image is not entirely correct, and it's actually quite incorrect in some ways, um, the French loved this image, and so they kind of projected it on the American army, and they portrayed the American army as a very hardy, masculine army. And so it helped the French army in some ways by, pre by presenting their army as being a help to this very masculine army. It made the French army even, even greater. That look, even this wonderful masculine citizen army needs our help. And so we will go and we will help this strong masculine army by being even cooler than they are and winning the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, and in fact, it was very, um, the, the, the French were also very enamored with the idea of General Washington and the image of this, this, this uh, uh, farmer who had left his farm to go and fight for his patrie and, and to die if necessary for patriotic reasons and things like that. And the French loved this idea of General Washington. They saw him as kind of a modern day uh, a Roman Cincinnatus figure. And so the play, French playwrights especially love to have scenes where the French army and the American armies together and George Washington praises the French army because again it, it, it helped the French army kind of revive itself um, after a difficult loss a few years ago. 
And there's one wonderful scene where the French army and the American army are, are marching towards each other on a hill, and they're going to meet each other for the first time. And of course, this never happened. Um, but French playwrights like to think that this might have happened. And again, they're, they're not necessarily trying to represent exactly what is, but what they would like to see, or they're trying to you know, put together a nice metaphor, a nice picture. And so the French army and the American army march up, and they meet each other, and they stand, and they look at each other. And General Washington says, oh, only you, the French, are capable of such wondrous deeds. And he tells his, French sol his, his American soldiers to go embrace your French counterparts as friends of liberty. And he says, oh, I am so glad that the French army has come to liberate us. And it's a very sentimental scene. And no, it never, ever happened. But the French really liked this idea that they were tying themselves to a very patriotic American force. Uh, and, and, and of course, obviously, it, it uh, helped the Americans very much as well. And the two armies embrace, and they're very happy. Now, when the French army was in North America, there was usually very little action or interaction between the French and the American armies. In fact, uh, Rochambeau and Washington both agreed that it would be best if the armies were kept entirely separate. So often people will ask me questions like, well, how much influence did the French army get from the American army as far as hanging out together, talking about revolution and talking about freedom? And we all know that the French Revolution is not too far off on the horizon in the beginning of the 1780s. It's less than a decade away. So, you know, is there any kind of revolutionary transfer as these two armies meet and meld and hug and kiss and drink together and all these things, which they never did. Um, and there is very little interaction between the two armies, so there's very little uh, influence from one army to the next. Uh, however, there was one study done uh, by a man named Forrest MacDonald back in the 50s, and he looked at, he tried to study French soldiers who are very hard to study because they left us very little written records. And so, th and, and we, all we have is some officers' accounts of them, but the officers were not usually particularly interested in how their troops felt deeply about things. Um, so he looked at, the, at, at, this, at these French troops, and he tried to see when they went back to France where they went. And he plotted out exactly which French soldiers went to which province in France. And then he did a, dif a different study where he looked at which provinces in France experienced the most violence during the French Revolution. And he found that those, that those two studies corresponded with each other. So he drew, he drew the conclusion that French soldiers returning from the American Revolution felt some kind of American revolutionary fervor and caused great violence during the French Revolution as they were fighting uh, to end what he called economic feudalism in their own areas. And they all wanted their own little farms. They all wanted to be small New England farmers or something like that. Uh, this is a nice idea, and it was an interesting study, and it's one of the few ways you can actually try to understand um, the French soldier, uh, at least as far as our methods will carry us today. But most historians look at that and think, what an interesting correlation. But there are many reasons for this interesting correlation. So it's, you, you, you can't necessarily pin um, violence in the French Revolution on the American Revolution, which happened almost a decade um, earlier. So I get that question a lot, and, and, and there's the answer for that. Aha. All right. So what I'd like to talk about next, and when I move on to this next, the, this, this next lecture, is really focus on what is the importance of the American Revolution for France. Because for the past three lectures, I've talked about France and North America and how France has affected North America. And you see that France has affected North America in several ways, um, uh, especially in, as far as American Revolution happening um, favorably uh, for the United States, which really, frankly, the America would not be free without the French. Um, from the very beginning, the French were able to supply money, uniforms, arms, uh, through rather secretive means, if necessary, while the French stood back and waited and watched to see how well the Americans would do. And then after the Battle of Saratoga, the French actually promised uh, troops. And after, after trying to bring troops with Destang, they finally succeeded in getting troops over with Rochambeau. And when Rochambeau and Washington were able to combine their forces with de Grasse and with Barat, they get the Battle of Yorktown, which is the decisive battle of the American Revolution and which allows America to finally be independent from Britain.